All right. All right, all right. Looks like I'm live from Nashville, Tennessee. And I just want to give it a second here to make sure I'm doing all of my proper broadcasting to Accelerators organization. What's up this morning, y'all? Got a little music going this morning just to get it started. Let's see what's up. Make sure that everything is working here before I launch in here. Camera's good. Everything is good. Live. All right, guys. Well, listen, let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to enable comments here so that I can see. If you're out there, please just shoot me a... Give me a thumbs up or say something that you can see me and hear me. That'd be great. By the way, I will start by saying I pre-ordered this book yesterday. And I'll, well, I'll start by saying that there's virtual school going on this window behind me. So if you hear, if you see children or dogs, and I'm going to shut this thing because it's going to be loud. Hold on. If you see or hear children or it starts to go nuts behind me, you'll know that's what's going on. By the way, if you are a business owner and you want to get creative and you want to do something very cool, you need to get this book. It just I pre-ordered it. I just got it yesterday. I'm going to read it, finish it today. I got through the first three or four chapters yesterday, and it's already mind-boggling, super, super cool. And I just want to make sure that I'm live here. So, sounds good. I'm going to go ahead and here and get started. Um, the way this is going to work is thank you for submitting some questions. I'm going to run through these questions. I'm going to give you what I think are some takeaways. And more than anything, um, I don't want to have a discussion about things that we can't go do something about, right? So it's one thing to feel a certain way and that's all well and good, but that almost always leads to action items, which you as the business owner must then go do, or at least go put a plan together for doing but don't sit on it don't wait there's no reason to wait on this stuff um, the whole world's going to pass you by while you're waiting okay so let's start here with the first question is coming from my buddy heather heather how are you i hope i really hope you're doing well out there um i want to connect let's connect soon i just want to check in on you um Heather asked, how much should I charge as a consultant for people wanting my expert help? Uh, and I have a, I, there's a business description here. I know a lot about her. She has several dog groomers across the U US reaching out, asking for information, knowledge about growing the business. I don't mind answering a few questions, but I want to, and I want to start adding consulting to my resume. I don't know how to charge uh, for this type of service and I'm looking for some, some advice. Okay, no problem. Now, uh, I don't know if you guys noticed what I did there. You can always replace the word but with and, and it is just a much stronger statement. Uh, so let's, I wanna, I'm going to reread that. I don't mind answering a few questions, and I want to start adding consulting to my business. Perfect. I love it. My simple answer on how much should you charge as a consultant for people wanting your expert help is as much as possible. If you're creating value for these folks that they're going to take away, they're going to go implement it, they're going to grow their businesses, and they're going to create more value and they're going to take big steps. I mean, why wouldn't you charge a premium for that? If you, particularly if you're the expert. So Heather, I, my biggest uh, thing that I want to uh, encourage you to do is not be shy and definitely don't charge too little because it's harder to go up in price than it is to come down. So I would be very bullish about how much you felt like the value you're creating. And at that point, I would rock and roll. And I would dare somebody to say, well, you cost too much. I'd say, well, you don't value it enough. If you wanna keep doing what you're doing, go right ahead. Or if you wanna work with me and I can help you and help you skip some steps, Skip over mistakes number 9, 10, 14, and 15 that I did three years ago. No problem. What's the story? Oh, it's a good one. Uh, big giant uh, cruise ship. They couldn't get the engine to turn over. 
So they called this this one guy who knows how to work on this engine. And they said, hey, how much do you, you know, we've got to get going. We've got, we've got a cruise to take. And the guy said, yeah, I'll come and fix it for $10,000. And they said, oh my God, that's a lot. But you know, we have to get out of here. Okay, we'll pay it. So the guy, old man shows up, walks up through this engine room, pulls out a hammer, taps the engine with the hammer, and it springs to life, turns on. And he goes, okay, that'll be $10,000. And they said, $10,000, what, are you crazy? All you did was tap it with a hammer. I'm not paying you that. He said, no, no, no. He said, the $10,000 for knowing where to tap the engine, right? That's the knowledge you have. Charge a premium, uh, Heather, and whatever you're considering charging, write it down on a piece of paper and then add 50% to it. You will get it. For the people who need, want your value, you'll get it. So I hope that that's helpful. And I really would love to know what happens, right? So once you lay that out there and you get some feedback, you know, keep, keep me in the loop and let me know how the market is reacting to the price that you set, because I feel like you will, you'll get it. Um, let me just make sure everything is going well here. And if there's anybody out there watching who could hit drop a comment or do something so that I can make sure that this is working properly, great. I'm on a different computer. Typically, I, uh, I could just fire this up and rock and roll. I'm on my wife's MacBook and it wasn't set up uh, completely. All right, let's go to Sarah Hamilton. Oh, this is a good one. How do I determine which KPIs I should be reviewing as a business owner as I'm growing? All right, well, I'll, um, description of the business. She owns a hair salon, two locations. She's expanding. She wants to set up a system to monitor data as we grow. How do I figure out what we should be looking at? And then what system software do I use to actually do it? What kind of consultant do I hire to help me with this? I'm not sure. Hey, Emily, thank you for dropping that on there. Um, I'm not sure that you need a consultant to do it, honestly. And that's your, and I'm a consultant, right? I don't talk, I don't want to talk myself or anybody like me out of a job. However, man, the software and the, 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 the all these kind of uh, uh, data platforms and stuff now are so good and they're so intuitive. I'm not sure you need to hire a consultant to do that. Uh, probably just devote some time on learning, you know, uh, um, Vern Harnish, the guy who wrote the book Scaling Up, and I was able, I had about an hour long conversation with him a week ago. And he just told me, he said, hey, I'll, JT, all the guys I'm working with, I'm encouraging to, th them to spend an hour or two a day on their biggest constraint. And you're like, damn, an hour or two a day, that's a lot of time. Sure it is. But if your biggest constraint right now is software to bring that expanding group of of locations together and to be able to monitor it and to be able to optimize the output and all this stuff. That's a big job. And instead of hiring somebody to come in and spend that time on your behalf, I don't think you need to do that. I bet if you spent an hour a day on it for two weeks, you would figure out which software to use. You would get online tutorials on how to use it. You would start using it. Not complicated, particularly with just two locations, right? Now, so the technology is one thing, but if we're talking about which, you asked the question, how do I determine which KPIs I should be reviewing as a business owner as I'm growing? I'm gonna make that one easy. There's actually, there is a uh, online software called Cashflow Story, cashflowstory.com. And in my, in my coaching practice, we use it to help people understand their cash flow, right? Because the number one thing, Sarah, that you don't want to do is you don't want to grow yourself out of business. You've got to make sure that you have enough cash to grow. In fact, the opposite is also true. If you don't have cash on hand, you cannot grow. Do not be borrowing money to grow unless you have a plan to pay it back very, very quickly. Right? That's going to get expensive and you're going to be chasing it for a long time. Um, so some of those KPIs, if you went to cash flow story, it's easy. There's only 18 data points that cashflowstory.com asks you to input. And then you can manipulate it all kinds of ways to see as I grow, my expenses go up by this much. Uh, and then now I have another location. So my rent and my overhead goes up by this. I need my revenue to go up by this in order to maintain the same cash flow. Um, so cash flow is going to be critical for you. Uh, and it sounds like good for you, you have a hair salon business, so you're not carrying around a lot of uh, 
accounts receivable and stuff, right? So you're getting your money. People are paying you when, they, when you render the service. That's cool. Um, those KPIs, I probably will be looking at income versus expenses. If the expenses go up, the income must go up. And I think by more, right? You need to be able to justify these new locations. Um, and when you open a new location, is it going to be as um, rock and rolling as the old one? No, it might take a minute to spin up, but you need to have a plan for that. Okay. Hey, well, it'll take a few months for this to be doing the same revenue as this one. Well, no, it won't. It'll take a few months for this one to get up to speed and the other one should continue to grow. So those are the kinds of KPIs that I'm talking about. Um, if you have hair salons where you have independent content, if people come in and rent a chair from you and stuff, probably that. What's the income from that? If you're driving a lot of value for those uh, ladies and gentlemen who are doing the work, you know, should you be charging them more to rent the chair? Right. So those are some things that I would look at. But when it comes to systems or softwares, um, software is awesome. It's only as good as the information going in and how much you use it. Um, so I would start with my that's my quick, easy way of saying start with something quick and easy that works and that you can understand. Um, you know, a lot of people I, I've seen big, giant businesses still running off QuickBooks. And I've seen little tiny pre-revenue startups that have Salesforce to the max, right? Which is about as far apart as you can get. Excel, spreadsheets, and QuickBooks, and, and um, HubSpot, which I really like HubSpot, honestly. Uh, it does about everything you might ever want it to do. And as you grow it, you can never outgrow it. But, you know, so you can do that research. I don't think you need a consultant to come and tell you how to, how to do that. Although by all means, if you feel like you do, don't listen to me. Go get one and just use them. Get all the info, set up your systems, and use them to the max. Okay? So I hope that was helpful. All right, Erica Wilkinson. Ooh, this is a good one. Uh, she said, what are things that you've done to rid yourself of negative friendships and relationships? All right? So, and this is a business question. Erica has a cleaning business, e-commerce store. She wants to scale up in real estate and marketing. She's got previous friends and relationships, and when she tells them about what's going on, uh, they always seem to get negative or tell me I should get a job at Walmart or that I think I'm better than other people. Or, ooh, let me, hold on, let me, <laughs> ooh, you like that? I'm gonna make a note here. That I think I'm better than other people or whatever. It's really hurting my feelings, and I'm trying to figure out how to overcome those feelings. Do I remove myself from those friendships? What have you done to overcome those things in your entrepreneurial life? Okay, Erica, thank you for this. I think that people who know me probably know what I'm about to say, but and it's early in the morning, but why not? Uh, what I would say, and I and you understand I'm a special case, right? Because um, I'm kind of out there. I like to be shocking sometimes. I do it for effect and for theater, right? Sometimes people need to be shocked to get the point. I don't want to hurt people's feelings, particularly if they're friends of mine from way back. However, if somebody said, hey, you should go get a job at Walmart, what do you think, you're better than me? My answer would be yes, hell yes. I think I'm better than you. No doubt about it. I'm gonna go make all of this shit happen. I'm gonna go, I have a cleaning business, I got an e-commerce store, I'm, I'm creating jobs, I'm employing people, I'm gonna scale up into real estate and marketing, I'm gonna go do all this stuff. And I don't have time in my life for people bringing me down. So yes, at this moment, I do think that I'm better than you. Can you handle it? Why don't you step your game up and be as good as me? That kind of thing, right? I think what you're, what you're dealing with there are people that have closed mindsets. Um, they're limited in their thinking. They're not gonna get over it. This is the world that they grew up in. You're gonna have to, you know, like bless and release, right? Bless your heart kind of thing, whatever. That doesn't mean you're not gonna be their friend. It just means you are not gonna put up with their petty bullshit anymore. I would tell them just like that. And you ask, hey, do I remove myself from those friendships? Yeah, if you need to. If your friends, if your so-called friends can't support you, then absolutely hell yes. They're not your friends, by the way. Friends support each other. Friends encourage each other's dreams, right? They don't want, friends also watch out for you. They don't want you to be reckless and they don't want, want you to make mistakes and stuff like that. It all probably depends on <coughs> their appetite for risk and those kinds of things. So before you remove yourself from that friendship, you should be completely straight up with them. And you should say, hey, I'm going to go do all this stuff. It's burning in my heart. 
I'm an entrepreneur. I'm not going to no, I'm not going to go get a job at Walmart. I'm telling you right now, folks, I'm JT Terrell. I live in Nashville, Tennessee, and I haven't had a boss since I was 17. I worked at Kroger in Lebanon, Tennessee. That's it. Ever since then, I was in rock bands. I was a professional musician for 10 years, and then I started my own company, and then I started another one, and I sold both of them, and now I coach other people on how to do it, and I'm never going to have a job, and I don't give a shit. And if people uh, in my world like, can't deal with it, they just have to get out of my world, I guess. You know, so I have a little bit of an attitude about it and you should too. It's entrepreneurs and business owners and people creating jobs that are making the world go round. It, it's going to be us and you are going to be the reason why we made it through this COVID pandemic. And, you know, the government's done their job. They've helped. They've given some handouts here and there, and that's all well and good and fine. But it's still boots on the ground, soldiers, Erica, like you out there making it happen. And when your friends want to sit around and talk about how much money the government can give them or their boss can give them a break or whatever, you know, I don't know. You are who you surround yourself with. So that's why you're in this group. That's why you're in entrepreneurs or, or accelerators organization. Sorry. Entrepreneurs organization is for folks that have a million dollars in revenue and up. YPO is for people that have, I think, 12 and a half million in revenue and up. There's organizations for all of you people everywhere, right? Just got to find where you fit in. And if your friends don't respect that, then yes, I think you should jettison them because they are not your friends. You don't have, you don't have to tell them to go up themselves, although that would be good if you did. All right, hope that helps. Okay, Francisca, this is, uh, all these are great questions, right? So I hope I'm, not, uh, hope I'm not repeating myself too much, but I like these questions. And they're different from the questions I normally get. Uh, I work with big companies, average revenue of 100 million plus, so the, the question, no question is more powerful than the other one. It's just a different set. That's why I like getting these, okay? Um, Francisca asked, uh, what things can I do to start developing the mindset of a leader building a company as opposed to a freelancer looking for work? Great question. And a little bit of the background is she's a um, freelance writer hiring other writers to meet demand. Right now, she's the face of the company and other clients expect her to do the writing herself. I want to switch to an agency model. Good. I'm glad that you want to do that because that's what you should do. Um, should I rebrand my business? So instead of marketing myself, I market the team or agency, or is it okay to continue doing what I'm doing, be the face of the company and have others ghost write? Okay, that's a couple of outcomes there, things you could do. I think long term, and this is just my opinion, long term, I think if you continue to be the face of the company and others ghost write, I think there's a shelf life on that, right? You'll, you will get to the point where it couldn't possibly be you doing all the work and it's gonna to start to feel weird. And by the way, the people who are ghostwriting on your behalf are not gonna enjoy that very much, right? Good ghostwriters eventually wanna have their name on the byline or on the, the work. So I think it might be a little short-sighted. Maybe for now, you could do that, fine. I don't, I'm not even sure you need to rebrand your business. Credible copywriting, great name. I love names that have what you actually do in the name and still sounds good, right? So a little bit of alliteration there, credible copywriting. Um, however, instead of marketing myself, I start marketing my team agency. That's the ticket. I think that's the ticket. Uh, and I think when it comes to talent and you're bringing people into your organization to do work with you, um, you need to make sure they're really good, right? So you want to make sure that their work is as good as yours. In fact, I'm going to go further to say most copy, okay, I'm, I'm generalizing. Francisca, Emily, Tim, Lisa, Mike, thank you guys for saying hi. So I know people are out there. Appreciate it. Um, I think that in order for you to attract the kind of talent that you want on your team, you're going to need to become really, really good at marketing that team because most people just want to do what they want to do. All right, I'm a copywriter. I just want to do copywriting. I want to get paid well for it because it's my passion. Great, love it. Being a business owner and stirring up that machine and the leads and the marketing, closing the deals and all that stuff, they don't want to do any of that. That's why they want to come work for you. So I think if you can get really good at marketing your team, your agency, having people on your team agency who are as good or better than you, and don't, be, don't have an ego. You can go find people better than you. 
who just don't want to sell themselves anymore. They want you to do it. Fine. I think what you might find over time is that your ability to market and sell these gigs is much more important and much more lucrative than you actually do in the work. So you could also cherry pick, you know, and say, hey, I've got this our marketing agency. I've got all these leads coming in. Hey, oh, hold on. I'm really interested in this project. I'm actually going to do the writing for that one. However, I'm going to source out everything else to a, you know, to writer A, B, C, D, F, right? So uh, I, I think it's a, in, you answered your own question. I don't think you need to rebrand your business. Uh, I think you need to market your team agency, not yourself. You are a part of that team. And um, if you need to have people ghostwriting on your behalf while you, while you ramp up the marketing piece, then so be it. Okay, so that's kind of a hybrid answer. I'm not all about effort, I'm about outcomes, right? The outcome, and I put a deadline on it. Now here we go, y'all know, the people who know me know deadlines are important. So Francesca, I would, I, just to know when this is gonna become a thing, and it's September 10th or 11th, if it's the 11th, I'm gonna feel bad, I should probably know that. It's the 10th, I think. Um, what you could do is say, hey, by January 1, I, I'm gonna spend now to January 1 marketing the team growing my team, getting talent on the team. In January 1, I, Francesca, am only going to do 25% of the work, writing work. The rest of the time I'm growing the business, working on the business. And you need to know that and everybody else on the team needs to know that so that they can all be aligned around getting all this stuff together and selling your, uh, your, your, your product, right? Um, coming up with better, by the way, Francesca and everybody, Francesca, Heather, we've had this discussion in person. Sarah, Erica, and everybody else I'm about to talk to. I'm about to be very general, so just go with me on this. You're taking the time to belong to Accelerator's organization. You're taking the time to learn and grow. You're taking the time to read and better yourself. And trust me when I tell you, everybody on this call, everybody in this organization needs to be proactively reading the book all the time. I mentioned this one. I'm not going to stop mentioning it. No Rules Rules by the guy who uh, founded Netflix. It's already an amazing book. I'm only three chapters in. And you know, here I am, Mr. Uh, here, Mr. Big Shot Business Coach, thought I knew everything. I learned more in the 35 minutes I read that book yesterday than I've learned in the last three months. Mind-blowing stuff, right? Because it's so innovative, so cool. And it fired me up, made me excited, right? So that's the benefit. So the fact that you are a part of this organization, you're asking questions, we're interacting and doing stuff tells me you are worth more and you should charge more for what you do across the board. Emily, Lisa, Marie, Tim, charge more for what you do. You're worth it. Okay. Let's go to Brad Coleman. Brad said, what do I do when an equity partner of mine isn't pulling their weight? A little bit of the background here. Um, business partners got some equity. I feel like I'm doing everything how can I start the conversation to help get things off the ground without demanding help, hurting the business relationship? Any advice on team building, even when they don't work for you, but with you? All right, so this is a couple, I'm just gonna circle a couple things. Brad, I'm gonna pick on you just for a second and it's all in love, so don't even worry about it. Nobody works for you. People work with you, right? And I don't even care, if, like if you owned a, a, a landscaping company and you had 50 people out there mowing lawns, Nobody works for you. They work for their family, their rent, their dreams, their future. They work with you to achieve it. And the second you flip that over, you're going to have more success with the people who work with you, right? But, and I get your point about an equity partner not pulling their weight. Um, how can I start the conversation that I need some help getting things off the grounds without demanding help hurting the business relationship? I'm going to make a little, so this is what, Brad, this is what I would do. You, you just said it right there. I'd sit down with the man or woman or whomever it is, and I would say, hey, first thing, I always set up difficult conversations by saying, hey, this is going to be a difficult conversation. Because I don't want to ambush them. Like, I want them to know. But then also tell them what the outcome you want is. So I'm going to pretend like the guy's name is Joe. Joe, this is going to be a difficult conversation, although I'm hopeful that by the end, we'll have a plan um, that will be a win-win for you and me. We can continue growing this business. Okay, can we have that conversation? And he'll say yes. 
And then you could say what you just wrote there. Hey, I need some help getting things off the ground. And, and I'm not getting the help from you that I need. Um, so my question is, are you going to give me the help that I need? Or do I have to go pay somebody else to give me the help that I need? At, at which point, I probably don't need you. Okay? And I don't want to be a jerk about it. And I don't want to be dramatic. I Like, literally, this is where we are. And I want you to help me with this, man. What's going on? Was this not what you thought it was going to be? You thought you were just going to put some money into the business and cruise because it's not that kind of business. You know, we're not rolling in dough. It will never be that kind of business. Even when we're not, even when we are rolling in dough, we're still going to be actively growing the business and doing stuff. So hurting the business relationship is one thing, but I think, Brad, why don't you go ahead and hurt it right now while it's small? You know, and I, I'm, I'm, I don't even know if it's small. I'm guessing it's a smaller business, right? And I can tell you from personal experience, it's better to blow it up now when you're doing $200,000 a year in revenue than when you're doing 200 million. Okay, so I'm just throwing that out there. Although just a real honest conversation, there's a book called Radical Candor that you might read and you might dig that. It might help a little bit just to get you in the mood. Um, one thing you could also do, any advice on team building, even when they don't work for you, but with you, right? Read the same book. Read the same book, right? And I'm, I'm honking this book just because I already love it. If you ordered this book, just came out, like I got it on pre-order and just came yesterday. If you got two of these and you gave it to your business par equity partner and said, hey man, read this book, I'm gonna read it too and then let's talk about how awesome it is, that might really spur some cool stuff. Now, if the guy doesn't even bother to read it, that would be just another example of, hey man, I bought this book, I want us to read it together so we can get some things going together in this business. And you won't even read the free fucking book that I gave you? I, I don't know what to tell you. I don't think we're good partners. You know, and that is well within your rights to do and say and protect your time and your money and your effort and all this stuff. So it's okay to be a little bit selfish when it comes to these things and have an honest conversation with, with the guy. I'm assuming, I don't know if it's a guy or, or gal and I, I don't care. Although, if you haven't given them that feedback yet, um, that would be another question. Like, do they even know that they're failing you in some way? And if they don't, man, that's, that's your fault. So like, I, I, I don't want to be hard about it. But if they don't understand that they are failing your business relationship, um, I believe that is your fault for not telling them. So some of your homework would be put, set up this conversation, prepare for it, and have your ducks in a row. I wouldn't be worried about making a point or winning an argument. That's not the point. The point is that you need help. You want to get it from your partner. And if your partner doesn't want to participate, you're going to have to get it from somebody else and there's a cost involved. And that cost is going to come out of the partner's stake, right? So if you do it in that way, that's hard for people to argue with, okay? So just, just throwing that out there. Um, and yeah, Lisa just commented and said, yeah, it shows they're not willing to put in the same effort as you. Which I agree with, although it, I get the feeling it might be a little bit murky about how much effort is, is desired. So and, and just make sure that that's crystal clear, okay? Let's go to the next one here um, from uh, Gabor. Should I hire someone who fits our culture but doesn't yet possess the skills for the job? A little bit of background. We have an employee we hired for customer service admin. Perfect culture fit, learned everything for the role. However, after a few months, it's become apparent that she hates this role. Her daily tasks do not match her personality type. I don't want to lose her. Uh, from a culture perspective, she's perfect. I was thinking of having her work directly with me on marketing, but she has no skills, experience in this role. Uh, so far, our work together is me explaining stuff. That we're a small family-owned business with three owners. You know, it's a small organization. We want to keep it lean. Admin shipping, we're okay with growing the number of employees to create new roles as long as you're revenue generating roles, fulfilling, fast growing. Yeah. All right. Well, listen, uh, I, li I liked what you said there. I think you're focused on the right things. You definitely don't want to have the wrong person in the wrong seat. You know, some of the work that Sumit <clears throat> did with the group at, at uh, Accelerators Live around culture index, and we know you put the wrong person in the wrong role. They're never going to give you the great results that you want, and they're going to be miserable. And why do we, why do we put each other through that? 
The flip side is there's somebody who, for that customer service admin role. There's somebody out there who's perfect for that who could, would love to do it. They, they'd be a rock star every day and live their best life. Now, if you believe that this, the, the uh, woman who's the perfect culture fit could do uh, marketing and you want to invest the time to teach her how to do it, then that's one thing. If you have the time and you can make the investment in her, just make no mistake, it's an investment in her. If the long-term payoff of investing that time in her is better, more effective than, than taking that money or those resources and just going to a marketing person, um, you know, if, it's, if you're teaching her to fish instead of giving her fish as far as marketing is concerned, then, then do it. That's your company, man. You can do whatever you want to. Uh, and I, I would be lying if I said that I didn't do that. I had people who I loved inside of my organization. I moved them into roles they weren't even close to qualified for. However, I thought it would fit their um, culture index. I thought it would fit their personality. And it was awesome. Gangbusters. They did very, very well. I also did it and it failed. So I think that, that if, if it were me, I might talk to the woman who's the perfect culture fit and say, hey, I want to move you into this marketing role. I'm going to teach you. These are the outcomes. This is how I need to see you perform over time. And, and just know that after a few months, after three months or six months, if it's not working out, uh, I'm going to pull the plug on it quickly. Like if we know it's not working out, I'm not going to just drag you around because I promised you something. Um, and then you'll set her up for success and just make sure that she understands what good looks like in the role, right? Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to give you training, uh, X amount of training for 30 or 45 days. And then at the end of 60 days, I expect you to be doing this stuff and having these kinds of uptick and results and inbound leads or whatever. As long as you're crystal clear with her about the results and you have a timeline in your mind about like, Hey, you know, I'm going to give up on you after this X amount of time then I think y'all you, probably could live with it. Uh, and you could go out and find when the next time you hire the admin role that, that she's leaving, make sure you get somebody who really wants to do that. And it's a special kind of person and uh, testing like culture index, disc assessment. Sumit has me uh, um, convinced culture index is, is much more effective when it's coming to putting the right people in the right role. Take the time, uh, um, take the expense of putting people through culture index and just make damn sure that the person in your customer service admin role really wants to do it. Okay. Great question. Okay. Law Jackson. Uh, the question that law asked is how do you trust uh, to hire people when you get overwhelmed with new business? You're not sure the new sales will continue. Yeah. Business description, solopreneur and freelance mode. I, uh, create animated marketing videos for marketing companies and startups. I'm trying to transition from a one-man band to a business owner with a team. The past two weeks were a struggle. I have seven open jobs, one being very urgent. I'm overwhelmed. I know I need to build a team. My fear is creeping in. What steps would you take to push through this? Um, yeah, it's scary when you're doing stuff you've never done before, right? Um, you, you need to have a law. You need to have a plan, man. Uh, you need to have a longer term plan than, and you mentioned two weeks here. And I know you're thinking bro more broadly than that, but you talked about the last two weeks and you're thinking about the next two weeks in context of the future and forever. If you thought about the next two weeks in the context between here and the end of the year, and then you thought about what 2021 should look like, what you, what you want it to look like. If I asked you, Hey, at the end of 2021, what, what do you want it? You said you wanted to build a team. Tell me what that team would look like. Well, right now it's just me and a couple of freelance people. And at the end of 2021, in a perfect world, it would be me selling accounts. And I probably would have three or four artists who work and like a, you know, uh, an account manager and this, you know, kind of really tell me what the team looks like. And then go ahead and start working against that plan. And if the plan dictates that you need to make some, like, officially hire a couple of people, which is scary, trust me. It's never not scary, by the way. I mean, like I, the first time I hired somebody, it scared the hell out of me because it wasn't just me. Now I had to worry about it was, uh, it was my employee and their family and all these people depending on me to make the right decisions. And it was scary. 
I didn't want to get out over my skis. And a couple of times, I mean, we're talking about over 20 years, a couple of times we got out over our skis, hired too many people. We bought a new piece of equipment. The demand wasn't there. And then I had to let some people go. And sure, it sucked. It also was not the end of the world. I, I think I felt uh, I wanted to end up feeling good about it in the way that you always want to leave people better than you found them, right? So you might say, if you're hiring people and you're bringing people onto a sales team and a fulfillment team, you might say, listen guys, here's the plan. Let me show you the plan. I want to grow revenue to this amount in the next six months, 12, 18, 24 months. In order to fulfill it, I need a team of about this size. Congratulations, you were the first person on this team. That's cool. My promise to you is two things. I'm going to be transparent about where the company's going. I'm going to share how much income's coming in, how we're doing financially. You need to know if you're on my team. You'll be able to see whether or not we're failing or succeeding. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to leave you better than I found you. I'm going to help you grow. I'm going to develop you individually. I am going to have a culture of growth and development inside of this organization. I'm going to provide you with really great leadership. And if the day ever comes where we don't have enough sales and I have to release you back into the wild, you're going to be better for it. So if you, if you want to accept that risk and you want to come onto the small growing team, come on with it. If you don't and you want to go to some more well-established place, then good. That, that is definitely your um, prerogative. Uh, I think law, if you do that, you'll feel great about it. Um, the steps to push through fear is to have a plan that dictates that you must go do these things. That's it. You can take fear out of it. And you know what? It, I mention this all the time. You know, there's literally physiologically and inside of our brains between our ears, there is no difference in the chemical electrical reaction between fear and excitement. Fear and excitement have the same synapse things firing. It's all on how we decide to react to it. So law, every time you feel fear, you can flip and turn it into excitement. You can. You really can. I mean, like I do it all the time. I do public speaking. I, by the way, I love to public speak, man. It's the best time of my life. Although right before I go on stage, I'm still scared shitless every time. And I turn that fear into excitement. And man, it just like launches me onto the stage. I can't wait. I have to release it. And I release it all over the audience, man. Like I, I'm, I want to, I'm turning their expectations and their excitement right back on them because I'm excited. So get a plan, be transparent. If you bring people in the organization, you gotta let them know what the plan is. And when you feel that fear, turn it into excitement. And once again, I, I, I just want to, uh, Sean saw Sean jump on. That's cool. I, Sean is big on this, certainly. I'm big on this. I'm looking at, I keep looking over here, I have a stack of about 175 books that I've read. Here's 176. Um, and I'm just telling you, you can get over some of the fear and you can turn fear and excitement when you, when you arm yourself with knowledge and books. Law, every time you get afraid of like taking that step, jump into a book that gets you fired up. Like Shoe Dog. The biography of Phil Knight, the guy that founded Nike, is a riveting, rocking and rolling thrill ride of a book. It is also very long because his life is very jam-packed with a bunch of cool shit. So go, go read an entrepreneurial book to get you fired up and then go do that scary thing. Okay? That's how you push through. Okay, Eric. Let's go to Eric. What's up, Eric? Uh, Eric's question, how do I get my team involved in the business to give me ideas instead of me always telling them what to do? A um, little bit of the background. I have a unique business, most likely requires technicians who are more street smart than book smart. I have to train them in how and what we do. I need to hire people who need a job, willing to get dirty. Uh, I need to be able to instill these individuals, our culture, groom them to think creatively when problems, uh, when they've probably never done this. What kind of things can I do to build a team and create a culture around this? Um, as a company. So, uh, Eric, sorry, get this book as soon as possible and read it. I'm on page number 33. I'm on page 33 and I, and I read that yesterday in about, yeah, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. 
And I was so jazzed up. I mean, it is all about innovation. It's all about innovation. And it's all about cultivating innovation, a culture of innovation, right? Which is exactly what this question is. So the number one thing that I prescribe for you to do is read the book, No Rules Rules by Reed Hastings, the guy who founded Netflix, and then take some of the stuff that they did that's applicable and infuse it into your organization. And this isn't just a book like with a bunch of cool stories, although it has a bunch of cool stories, like this has how to, you know, I mean, it's got like funnels of things that you could and should do to have everybody in your organization being innovative on your behalf. You want to set up parameters for them, right? So they can't run off and just do a bunch of crazy shit that costs you a bunch of money and, and is, causes you liability and those kinds of things. Although you can put forth the expectation that you need them to be creative in order to be successful in their role, that, that innovation is part of your DNA. I don't know what the core values of your core, uh, uh, of your, um, if Rad Exclusion Services has core values, I know they do, I just don't remember what they are because I think I was there when we talked about them. Um, I don't know if you have a core value around being innovative. If you don't, you should. If it's important for you and you just said, I need to be able to instill individuals to get them to think, to get creative when they've probably never done this, get creative. Uh, we need more street smart than book smart. Um, yeah, there's two right there, two possible core values. More street smart than book smart or get creative. If you were hiring somebody in off the street to do this work and you said, hey, our core values are show up and blow up, outwork everybody, protect the customer and get creative. That would automatically say to people, wow, that's part of their core values. It's right there on their shirt. It's on the truck. I need to be creative. So before I, I run into a problem and I'm going to call Eric and ask him what to do, it's right there. My core value is get creative and solve the problem. So that's what you can do to get your team more involved in the business and read the book, No Rules Rules. If you do those two things, you'll be on the road uh, to making it happen sooner rather than later. Okay. Okay. Check, time check here. Yeah, doing good. Okay. <clears throat> Christopher Joseph asked a question. Do you do successful people ever hit a wall and get overwhelmed or stressed? And if so, what do you do to push? <laughs> what do you do to push through? Uh, the, dis the description of the question, this is something I've struggled with as a young entrepreneur. It doesn't happen often. When it does, I'm not sure whether to push through, even though I don't feel efficient or whether it's my body telling me to take a break so I can reset. I just want to understand if this is normal for entrepreneurs to feel this way. Yes, absolutely, completely. Um, every business owner, member, leader who I work with, and right now it's about 15, and these are very successful. Some of these guys are uh, hundreds of millionaires, right? Not quite billionaires, but they're getting there. Um, and I can tell in the first 30 seconds of speaking with them on a video call if they've hit the wall or not. And I'm just going to go and let you know this whole COVID thing that we're all living through, it ain't over yet, um, has caused a lot of additional stress, pain, roadblocks, emotional stuff. The fallout of COVID will not be economic, okay? The economy has bounced back in a, in a major way, in large part, across every sector, with the exception of hospitality and airplanes, although they'll come back. Um, the big fallout is gonna be, for all of us, in our, between our ears. It's gonna be stress, anxiety, emotional problems, suicide, unfortunately. Um, so what you can do so t tactically, all right, uh, you asked a question, Christopher, I'm gonna give you an answer. Tactically, what are the things that you can do? Meditate. The people who I know who are able to break through the best when they're feeling stressed and they still wanna operate at a high level, every one of them does meditation on a daily basis. Now, a lot, you know, guided meditation, you could use an app, Transcendental meditation, whatever. Uh, I, I'm a Christian person, right? So I'm not saying that meditating is anti-Christian. All I'm saying is when I am introspective, like when I go to my quiet place or whatever, I need to be talking to Jesus Christ, right? Or else 
who knows where my mind and my heart's going to go. Like, and I don't want to go anywhere else. I've gone other places before in my life and I don't want to be there. So when I meditate and I do meditate every morning, it's about 10 minutes. I'm essentially, I'm in prayer, but it's the same thing. You know, you could, if you want to listen to a guided, uh, Meditation about floating around in the ocean and going to your happy place, the center of your soul and whatever, man, go right ahead if it makes you feel better and you're able to kind of reset your body because the output of it is like, it's good for your heart, it's good for your mind, it's good for your, physiologi your physiology, everything. Also, I'm, as long as I'm preaching, you should take care of yourself physically. You should be physically fit. If you're not physically fit now, you need to get fit there's not a member leader who I work with who the one of the first conversations I have in the very first, they'll be telling me about their business. And, oh, yeah, we did 500 million last year and we're taking over the world. And I'll say, yeah, yeah, that's great. Tell me about your exercise routine. Oh, well, I don't have time for that. And I'm like, yeah, you don't have you don't not have time for it. You got to be fit physically, mentally, spiritually, and it all goes together. Not not one thing can make up for the other things. So I think you need to be well-rounded in your fitness. So mentally fit, physically fit, spiritually fit, emotionally fit. And if you do that, you're going to be able to withstand these ebbs and flows of entrepreneurship because that never stops. It's never going to stop. Biggie Smalls said it best, right? More money, more problems. And I'm just here to tell you, I, there was a time I had zero money and it sucked. Um, and, and, but I knew what I needed to do. I could get some money. Um, so I got some money and guess what? It's better, you know, I mean, I can, I can handle problems a little more easily, but there's a whole new cro crop of problems and stuff to worry about. So um, it, I, I'm more emotionally well now than I was then only because I've made it a priority. Uh, if I weren't, I'd be a complete train wreck now, right? But I put some things into my daily life, prayer first thing in the morning, I work out at least 30 minutes a day those kinds of things, and you should do the same. And if you do, you'll be able to withstand these things. Okay, I hope that was helpful, but, and, and it's just really, really important. And don't let other people stick. Who was it uh, earlier? Was it um, Erica was talking about people bringing her down and friends telling her things aren't important? When you make time to protect your mind, soul, body, to be fit and well-rounded and everything, and people are telling you, oh, well, now hold on. Don't go for that run. I need you to handle this thing, even if it's a client. I've told clients before, nope, sorry. I don't know what to tell you. This is important to me. I work out 30 to, 30 to 60 minutes every day. I'm going to do this. I know you need me right now. I'll get back to you after my workout. You're really putting that workout ahead of my, me? Yes, all day, every day, forever. Any questions? Leave me alone. Your price is going up, right? So just protect yourself and you'll be able to uh, be more mentally fit, which is what I want for everybody on this, on this call. All right, got a couple more questions and we got about 10 minutes left, so we're doing good. Um, Allison from um, A Strategy Marketing. What can I do to manage stress as an entrepreneur, especially during this COVID pandemic? Well, we just mentioned it, right? Uh, you own a digital marketing agency, easy to handle stress before the pandemic, take hikes, go out, but now that it's not safe to do any of those activities, I'm finding it difficult to de-stress. Any tips from mentors gone through this while running a business? Now, listen, I don't know, Allison, I don't know where you are, um, but you can still go outside. I mean, I, you know, I, even in New York, like, and I've got, because I've got a lot of clients who live in Manhattan and they live on, in, uh, um, um, geez, Westchester County and Long Island. You can still go out and exercise, right? It may not be as much fun. Well, you may not be able to go hike your favorite trail or whatever, but you can still go out. And if you can find ways to, you know, we mentioned anything difficult to de-stress. Meditation, you don't have to go anywhere. Um, uh, mentors who've gone through an economic, uh, economic downturn while running a business. And just don't, don't get it. I, I just want to, this is a mindset thing, all right? This is not an economic downturn. This is going to be a V. The bottom dropped out in April and May, and then it shot right back up, almost back up to where it was. I don't know if anybody's noticed that, but if you look at the Dow Jones, it is, you know, it's almost back up to the level that it was, and it's, it's, you know, it's ebbing and flowing. I don't believe this is an economic downturn, and I don't think that we as entrepreneurs should treat it as such. Um, there's a book 
It's in here somewhere, but I can't reach it. There's a book uh, by Malcolm Gladwell called David and Goliath. And for everybody on this call particularly, you're all a bunch of little Davids. And Goliath is the whole business world and the whole economic system that you're fighting against every day. So I suggest you read the book, David versus Goliath by Malcolm Gladwell. And uh, what I'm experiencing right now in my practice is overwhelming demand. People are calling me, that everybody wants to work with me. They don't even care what it costs. Um, I'm running out of bandwidth, truly. And I, I was asking myself, damn, what is that about, man? Why are these people coming out of the woodwork? And so I read back through David and Goliath, and there's a chapter in there about um, back in World War II. I don't know if you all remember your history, but, you know, Germany invaded France. France surrendered. And then they had their sights set on England, and they decided that the best thing to get, the best way to get England to surrender would be to bomb the hell out of them day after day after day. It was called the Blitzkrieg. Uh, and so they started doing that, and it was absolutely terrifying for everybody who lived in London for a while. And then the weirdest thing happened. Days and nights went by with this continuous bombs falling on London. And yes, some people died, but everybody else who didn't die got this really, really weird sense of invulnerability. Um, Malcolm, Malcolm Gladwell kind of goes into how human brains in, interpret risk and danger. And after you've overcome that danger, like a, um, like a, a, a test pilot or a skydiver, you're not scared of it anymore. You look forward to it. This sense of invulnerability is what the citizens of London ended up with, which is why, I don't know if you remember, you've seen the signs like Winston Churchill said, keep calm and carry on. Go about your business. That's where that little meme comes from. So that's exactly what they did. And later, after the war, one high-ranking German official said that was their biggest tactical mistake of the entire war, and that it, they, had been, they would have been better off if they'd never dropped one London, one bomb on London, because they made London unconquerable. So I just want you guys, as entrepreneurs, to think about economic downturn and, and COVID and all this stuff. And guess what? You're all still in business, aren't you? You might have taken a beating for a minute, but you're still in business. You're still watching this video. You still have a ton of opportunity. I can guarantee you a bunch of your competitors did not stay in the game. They cashed out. They went under. They went bankrupt. They, they, they sold to somebody because they just couldn't handle it. They're going to go get a job at Walmart like, like Erica's friend was talking about. You guys didn't do that. You are unconquerable. By definition, literally, you're unconquerable. You lived through COVID. So it is time to, to, it is time to now take that feeling of invulnerability and it's time to, to grow, okay? And, and I just want you guys to, to remember that this time you're going to look back on this and say, man, it's one of the best things that ever happened to me. It forced me to get lean. It forced me to get creative. It forced me to learn how to do other things. It forced me to look at my cash flow and understand it better. Okay. So I hope that helps Allison. Um, so one last one here from Marlena. Marlena says, is it acceptable to let any employee go due to their negative mindset? Uh, yes, absolutely. Negative mindset will bring down all everybody all day, all the time. And I would just, first thing I would do is tell them, hey, I'm considering firing you because you are a pain in the ass and you're a pain in the ass every day and you're negative every day and I'm tired of it. Uh, uh. <laughs> and they'd be like, oh my God, really? You'd really fire me for that? You better say, yes, I would. Now, now that I've told you that, I want to see you getting better, okay? And what that means to me is in two weeks, I'm going to check in with you and say, hey, great job. I, you really turned your attitude around. I appreciate it. Or, hey, you've done nothing to get better. And I expect, you know, I'll accept your resignation. You know, I mean, like, I literally, yes, Marlena, I'm going to answer your question. Is it acceptable to let them go due to their negative mindset? Yes, it is, period. And you should because they're bringing you down, everybody around you, probably your clients too. So 
I, I would not put up with it. Although I'm not sure I would run out and fire her right this second. I would probably tell her. You know, maybe she doesn't realize that she's doing it. Some people are completely not self-aware, right? So that's that's something that, you know, as a leader, you could do. Um, so I want to finish up here just by saying, and I'm going to go back to, um, I was thinking about, I was, uh, I read through these questions and then I took a shower and I was thinking about this question about what have you done to get rid of negative friendships and relationships? All of you, I'm sure you've got people telling you all the time, well, you should just get a job. This is not going to work. You think you're better than me and all this kind of stuff. And I want to leave you with a, a quote, which I think about all the time. And uh, I want you just to take it with you. And this is, this is nothing new. It's a meme. Um, you, should, you should get the meme. You should put it right on the front of your phone. A lion does not concern himself with the opinions of sheep. Okay? You guys are all lions. Go be lions. Let the sheep be sheep. I wouldn't give even a, a, a hint, a whiff of uh, energy to people who, who want to try and bring you down. Don't let them do it, guys. Listen, I hope this has been helpful. I sure appreciate you guys. If you, um, if you need anything, you can reach out to me, JT at PetraCoach, P-E-T-R-A, coach.com. I'm happy to answer questions and stuff. This has been great. Uh, I was late. I, did, I wasn't able to do this in August, so I'm going to do another one in September, so be looking for that. And I appreciate it. Appreciate you guys very much. Thanks. Have a great day.